Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a new lecture inside our Jean Monnet Open Online Course of European Integration, which this year is focused on economic development. The topic we are discussing today is a very important topic. It is usually a topic of great interest uh, for students, especially for those who do not know much about how the European Union works. And especially also for students that come from countries or uh, regions uh, that um, are lagging behind in development and who are one of the greatest uh, beneficiaries of the European Union's budget. The topic that we are discussing today is the European Union budget and redistributive policies. And we will see, for instance, the EU's regional policy, we will see the EU social policy, and we will see, last but not least, the European Union's common agricultural policy, one of the most important policies of the EU, one of the first and the most important policies of, of the EU. We have uh, with us today one group of students uh, uh, in Chernitsi uh, with Valentina and another group of students also in Chernitsi with Irina. Thank you very much uh, for your presence. <clears throat> we also have students who are watching on YouTube live because this uh, lecture is being broadcast on YouTube live. As we have mentioned in every, in every lecture, uh, this is possible because of the support, the financial support from the European Commission through the Jean, Jean Monnet actions, um, in concrete, through um, Jean Monnet chair in European political economy. And um, we also have other uh, sponsors, which are the Alexandru Jan Kuza University of Yash and the University of Suchava, both in Romania. It's important for us to recognize who our sponsors are. This acknowledgement is not only um, because of gratitude, it's also because of transparency. You should know who is supporting our, um, our course. <clears throat> Georgiana Padular, welcome. Hi. We put you in mute. Good. So, today's topic is the EU budget. Uh, people usually, when they come from Romania, when they come from uh, Ukraine, they think about the EU and they think about the EU as a source of opportunity, sometimes in terms of funding. They think about European Union funds what great opportunity they represent for them. And they think that the, the European Union is mostly about that sometimes. They think the EU is about receiving funding, about receiving money for projects uh, and to, to help the, the poor regions uh, develop. <clears throat> It is very important for us to know from the start, if we are discussing about the EU budget, you, we should understand how important the EU budget really is. And the EU budget is unlike national budgets in, in that it is much smaller. The EU budget is by comparison with national budgets very small. It is 40 times smaller than national budgets. So the EU budget uh, is limited to 1.20% of the 
of the European Union's gross national income. This means that what for what is produced by the European Union as a whole in one year, only one percent is spent on the EU budget. This may seem a lot, yes, 145 billion euros may look a lot, but it is very small compared to the budgets of national governments that represent between 40 and 50 percent of mm, national income in their countries. Paula, welcome. We put you in mute. Okay. <clears throat> so the 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 idea about the EU budget is that it's small. In our first lecture, when we discussed about what the European Union is, we uh, said that the European Union has a great power, a great power to affect our lives, to affect our lives as citizens, to affect the, 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 the lives of firms who produce in the European Union, outside the European Union. The EU has a great power, but we said that this power is not mm, through the budget mostly, because the budget is relative, relatively small. It is mostly through regulation of the single market. We've seen the single market last week, and we said that is the most important policy of the EU. It's the core policy of the EU. And the other policies sometimes are created to make the single market work better. And in the case of the budget, in the case of uh, <clears throat> spending, decisions and on, on the own resources of the European Union, the budget policy in general is intimately related to the single market. Some authors say that the EU budget and most of the expenditure policies of the EU are side payments, are side uh, policies for the main policy, which is the single market that we saw last uh, last week. <clears throat> but today we will see the budget. And even though we say that the budget is small, the budget is just 1.20% uh, of the EU's gross national income, the EU budget can be very important and it can have a great effect on the European Union. Valentina, I put you in mute again. If it works. <coughs> okay. So the EU budget is small, yes? But for some people, the EU budget can be very important. The EU budget is small, we said, but for us, that we have this online course and we have this Jean Monnet chair of European political economy, the budget is important for us. For individual countries, the budget can be very important. For countries such as Hungary, Romania, or Greece, the budget can represent 3 5% of their uh, gross national income. It means that in, in that country of your wage, maybe 5% on average comes from the EU budget, but this is on average. For some people, 100% of their income comes from the EU budget. 
and for some regions the EU budget represents a lot. So it's very important for us to try to understand how the European Union budget works. And this is a very, very, very interesting question because it has many uh, debates, many underlying debates about the EU budget that we will see along the, the this lecture, yes? So first, the budget, remember, it is relatively small. It represents 1.20% of the European Union's aggregate gross national income, which is 40 times less of what the national government budgets represent. <clears throat> Good. The, the EU budget is like any other budget, is like an accounting document that has the income and the spending. Yes, how so it has the sources of income and it has the destination of that thing. Xenia, Oksana, welcome. We put you in mute. I think they're having problem with Valentina's group in Chernivtsi and they are connecting and disconnecting with, with different accounts. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> um, the, the, the budget, let's, let's start with the, with the source of the budget. Where does the money come from? The, the money in the budget, initially, when the European Economic Community was created, it came from contributions from member states. So member states, they contributed money. Each member state was assigned a contribution that they should make to the European uh, Union budget. But... Um, soon after the, the creation of the European Economic Community, and mostly when the um, common agricultural policy was created, promoted by, by the French government, the French were especially interested in the common agricultural policy because their country had a lot of agriculture, and the French insisted that the EU should not be based only on national contributions, it should have a system of own resources. So the EU should be um, financially autonomous, not depend only on the contributions from the member states. And the system of own resources was created then. And nowadays, the own resources of the uh, European Union cover three main sources of, of, um, of money, which are first, the so-called traditional own resources, which are um, usually the customs duties and, and sugar levies, agricultural levies that are collected by the European Union at the external borders from third countries that want to export into the European Union. These uh, import taxes, they do not go to the governments that uh, control those borders, they go to the European Union budget. And these are called the traditional own resources. So when, for instance, a Chinese a ship comes to the, the port of Rotterdam in the Netherlands and brings some, uh, uh, I don't know, mobile phones or whatever, and they have to pay import uh, taxes into the European Union. This money goes to the European Union budget. Only 20% of that money remains for the Dutch government for the collection costs. It's like for the administration costs of the system, they keep 20%, but the other 80% goes to the EU budget. 
These are called traditional own resources. The second uh, own resource is uh, based on VAT. It's based on, um, do you know the value added tax? I, I don't know if in Ukraine there is a value added tax. In, in Romania, they also have one, they call it TVA. In Spain, there is one, they call it IVA. In, in the UK, there is one, they call it VAT. Uh, the, the, the value added tax, the, it's, um, how do you call it? It's a sales tax. Yes, that it, it is uh, compulsory in all the European Union member states. The rate of this tax varies from one country to another. There are some countries where it is more than 20%. In other countries, it's less than 20%, but it's around 20% in the countries. There are also differences between the product groups. There is a standard VAT rate, and usually in some countries, there are reduced uh, VAT rates for some products such as um, food or medicines or other kinds of products in which the government wants to lower the, the tax rate. But from the harmonized tax base of the countries, this means from all the sales, all the final sales that uh, take place in, in, in the member states that are subject to VAT from the harmonized base, 0.3% goes to the European Union budget. Yes. So if in Romania, the VAT rate is 20% or 21% or 24%, but that goes to the Romanian government. But only 0.3% goes to the European Union budget. Of course, the EU budget is much smaller, as we said, the national uh, government budgets. And that now we, you see how it's smaller also in the money it uh, collects from taxes. And finally, the third the own resource is based on national contributions from the member states based on their um, uh, national income. So the, the richer states contribute more than the uh, smaller states, for instance. So these are the three main own resources of the EU. The traditional own resources, mostly import taxes in the external borders. Second, it's uh, the own resource base based on VAT, which is 0.3% of the VAT base. And then a, a national contribution based on national income. <clears throat> and this already brings us to the first question. Usually, in the member states, when they have a budget, they usually, um, they usually have uh, what is called progressive taxes, yes? Sometimes, um, you know, they have like um, different uh, tax rates depending on how much you earn. So the richer people, they pay a greater percentage of their income in taxes. This is usually in the member in the member states, yes. Uh, so so the richest people, they pay more than proportionately. Of course, in every country, the richer people they pay more, yes. Even if they all pay twenty percent or nineteen percent, if you earn more, you pay more. 
but there are some countries where the tax system is called progressive. It means that if you earn more, maybe you pay 30% of your income in taxes. If you earn on average, you pay 20%. And if you earn less than average, maybe you pay, you pay only 10% of uh, 10% of your income. So this this is called progress, progressive taxation. Yes. The other options is proportional taxation, where everyone pays the same rate. Yes. Or this one another possibility, which is regressive taxation which would mean that those who earn less, they pay a greater proportion of what they earn. So this would mean that the poorer people pay 30% taxes and the richest people, they pay 10% taxes. So in most countries, the, the tax system is progressive. In most EU countries, it is progressive. In some countries, it's a proportional system, but in most of them, it is progressive. But the EU budget, if you look at the own resources based on the uh, traditional own resources and the VAT and the national contributions, the system looks much more proportional than progressive. So this is a difference between the EU and the national systems, yes? You know now in, in Spain, uh, there is a problem with um, uh, government, a regional government that wants to claim independence for the region. And one of the arguments they use is that they pay too much to the e, e, to the Spanish budget and they receive too little. They say that they pay more than they receive. Yes? And this could make sense because this is a richer region in the country. And if, uh, if taxes are progressive, if you are richer, you pay more. Yes? So, if your region has a greater proportion of rich people than other regions, it makes sense that uh, uh, your claim that you are paying more than the rest. Yes? But this is normal in many countries. Yes? It's normal in the US too. California is richer than other states. <coughs> and they pay more. Uh, on average than, than other states. It also happens in Italy, yes, with Lega, Lega Nord, the, the region of Lombardy, they pay more uh, on average in taxes than region on the south, such as Sicily, yes? Well, in the case of the EU, it's different. It's not that the richer um, regions pay proportionately more. They pay with a proportional system. They pay uh, as a function of their wealth. And then even there are some member states that complain that they pay too much compared to what they receive from the EU. And they say that the system is not satisfactory and they negotiate a system of corrections, yes? And the most famous such correction is the so-called the British rebate, the UK rebate. When Margaret Thatcher was the prime minister of the UK, she negotiated for the UK a system in which after complaining that they pay too much to the EU budget, but they did not benefit so much from EU policies because agriculture was not very important in the UK. They used to, to import their agricultural products from 
the Commonwealth countries not uh, produce uh, so much themselves, and from other policies they did not receive so much, they they asked for a system in which the the EU would give them part of their money back. So this system is called the UK rebate. Uh, and sometimes in, 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 in France, they call it the British check. So it's, it's an amount of money that every year the UK government receives back from, from its contributions to the EU. And this is as a function of a calculation, a complex calculation of what the UK contributes and what the UK receives from the EU. And 66% of the gap between the contributions and the benefits from the EU, 66% is paid back uh, to the UK as a form of rebate. This rebate was initially only for the UK, but now in latest uh, uh, years, the many more other European countries have asked for rebates have asked for, for correction mechanisms. And these correction um, mechanisms are really, I will, I will tell you exactly how many they are because there are many for me to, to remember. So the UK was the first one, but uh, now, for the period 2014-2020, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Sweden also benefit from reductions in their uh, uh, annual uh, contribution based on national income. So it's already Denmark, the Netherlands, and Sweden. Then also, um, Austria benefits from a reduction for for um, <coughs> because they also claim that they they pay too much. The, this reduction for Austria is for two thousand fourteen. 2015 and 2016 only. Oops, see. And then also for the period 2014-2020, the Netherlands, Sweden and Germany, instead of paying 0.30% of their VAT base towards the EU budget, they only pay half of that. They pay 0.15%. If you look at these countries that benefit from special treatment as far as own resources are concerned, you have the UK, Denmark, the Netherlands, Sweden, Austria, Germany, which are countries that are richer than average inside the EU. The countries I mentioned are not Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, Portugal, or Hungary, or Poland. No. The countries I mentioned were the UK, Denmark, Netherlands, Sweden, Austria, and Germany. Yes? This means that this common system of own resources with its on rates which are already proportional, they are not progressive, they are proportional rates. But these countries demand that this system is, is corrected and to, uh, to pay lower rates. Yes? So if the system in the EU for own resources is not progressive. We said it was more or less proportional. But after all these correction mechanisms, they are called correction uh, mechanisms, the system becomes regressive. 
So it's a system of own resources in which the richer countries, they pay a lower proportion of their income to the EU budget. Yeah. So this is already one question, one very interesting question for discussion about the EU budget. Yes. If the EU budget is a progressive, proportional, or regressive, because this it's it's a complex uh, question, yes. But it's also a good question that to allow you to show that you know how the EU budget is financed. Yes. <clears throat> good. Georgiana Padurar. Please remove your mute. Can you? Good. Hi. Hi, Georgiana. So tell me, Georgiana, you know, we have many students in, in Chernivtsi, in the group uh, coordinated by Irina Tkachuk, who study economics there in Chernivtsi. And maybe they know more about the budget, about taxes, and so on. What have you studied before? I studied letters. You studied uh, letters, yes? And what did you study there? Liter literature or what? The, yes, I studied literature of English and uh, German. Ah, very good. So maybe this this uh, topic is a little bit difficult for you or not? It's new. All that I hear is new for me. I, I hope that we make it uh, understandable to people who do not necessarily need to be experts in finance, experts in in public finance, yes, to understand. Yes, very clearly, but um, all the sounds are new. Yes. But it's good, you know, it, it means more effort for you, but it also means that you will learn more than the other people. Good, thank you very much. Thank you. How about uh, Paula Rashkitor? Can you remove your mute? How about now it works? Hi, hi, yes, it works. <laughs> well, I have studied in such a nice place. Sorry again? Where are you now? It looks like I'm a very nice outside. place. Outside in the in the garden. <laughs> wow, this is great. You know? We we have nice weather still. Our our course is very important, you see. Because our classroom, it has garden, it has uh, <laughs> sometimes different kinds of weather. I hope that in the in the future, if our program grows and it can happen in, in different continents at the same time, and maybe in some of them they will have snow, in the other countries they will be on the beach, <laughs> following our course, maybe. Thank you very much, Paula. So you also you, you also studied letters, like um, yes, as uh, my colleague Georgia and I studied as well uh, English and Spanish on the Faculty of Letters. <laughs> and what are you studying now? Uh, now I've just decided to to switch uh, to switch to something different and to learn something that is up to date. And I prefer to come here to this uh, university. Yes, but what is, what is the what is the name of your master's program so that the other students in Ukraine know? Uh, in English, would be uh, studies of international development. Aha, international development. It it, it looks yes. good. So so this course is very good for you, right? It's about uh, right. development. We are seeing now an introduction about the EU, but soon we will focus specifically 100% on development. So I hope it's helpful uh, for you. Thank you very much for your presence, Paula. I put you Thank in you again.
Good. <clears throat> Our students in, in Chernivtsi with um, Irina's group. Uh, I don't know if you have understand so far about the system of own resources of the EU. How the EU is financed, yes? It's a small budget, yes? And it comes from the traditional own resources from VAT and from gross national income contributions of the member states, right? For you, I think it should be easier to, to understand. How about Valentina's group? Because I always, you know, I don't really know about Valentina's group because it's a group about international international studies or something like that please remove your mute in, in valentina's group so what is it that you study there because i saw that you are in a different place very nice place i like i like it very much today and i don't know what's the difference between what what irina at kachuk does upstairs and what you do there? What's the difference in your degrees? Um, well, I must say that the difference is not the big one from the courses we have taken because our students' major is uh, <clears throat> international studies. It comprises public communication, regional studies, and besides, they are mastering uh, seven languages, European languages, English, German, French, Spanish, Romanian, Polish. Okay. <laughs> wow. So that's very, very good, uh, you know, a very good program, probably one of the most prestigious programs at the university. Naturally, we are really happy because our college is named College of History, Political Science and International Studies. Aha, very good. I'm really, really happy to have such a diverse a origin of students. I know that there are other students that are watching also on YouTube, there are five uh, simultaneous connections now on YouTube, in addition to our connections by Google Hangouts. And I'm, uh, I'm really happy about this because I believe that all together with our diversity, we can um, understand more about how the European Union works. I said that the topic today may look a little bit technical for for someone but i try to make it simple so that it can be understood by by everyone thank you very much uh, and i continue with the lecture i put you in mute <coughs> okay my friends so we have seen um, the size of the eu budget we have seen where the money comes from how the the european union collects the money for for its budget now what we will see is how the european union spends that budget you know budgets they they are documents that have two sides they have the source of funds and they have the destination of the funds yes we look now at spending how the budget is spent <clears throat> and if you look now at the at the headings at the official website of the European Union and you uh, you look for how the budget is spent they tell you that 46% of the budget is spent on a smart and inclusive growth it's like a big heading yes that inside it it includes regional policy it includes social policy and it also includes industrial policy competitive industrial competitiveness policy so they have put regional policy this means assistance for regions that are lagging behind 
social policy assistance for groups that are lagging behind and industrial policy assistance for firms to be competitive in the EU. They put them together under heading, they call it smart and inclusive growth, so that it represents 46% of the budget. And then the next heading they mention is um, something like uh, guaranteeing uh, security of food supplies and quality of food and good things about food. Yes. So this essentially means the common agricultural policy that represents 41% uh, of spending. 41%. Yes. Just one policy. The common agricultural policy represents 41% of the whole spending by the European Union. When they put together regional policy, social policy, and industrial policy together so that they add up 46%, it is because they wanted it to be greater than common agricultural policy statistically. They wanted to show people that the EU budget is not spent mostly on agriculture. And this is just for image reasons of the EU, because sometimes the European Union is ashamed that it spends so much on agriculture and so little on other headings. Because agricultural spending, the common agricultural policy has been the first policy in the European Union and the most important policy for expenditure. In the mid 1980s, the common agriculture policy had grown so much that it represented two thirds of the budget. Two out of three euros spent by the EU in the mid 1980s was spent on agriculture. And sometimes this is policies that are considered by, by some people as inefficient, by subsidies to farmers or um, other, other kind of policies that um, are controversial. Yes, there are some people who defend those policies very much, mostly farmers that benefit from them. But there are the people that complain about those policies. They complain that these policies are bad for consumers. This complain they are bad for taxpayers that have to spend almost uh, half the EU budget on agriculture. And it is bad also for third countries because it's, it's bad for, um, for other countries that also produce agricultural products, usually less, developing, less developed countries, and they cannot uh, export to the EU because the EU market is protected to, uh, in the framework of the common agricultural policy. Some people also complain about the common agricultural policy and they say that it's even bad for the environment, that uh, the common agricultural policy, sometimes they can encourage to produce too much and it's bad for the environment. Although nowadays the common agricultural policy has been um, refurbished and it's, it's now more, uh, it cares more about about uh, um, the environment, but still it's one of the criticism. You see that there's a seminar question, I think, I don't remember exactly, but probably I have included in this course about the common agricultural policy. 
this is an important topic for our course because you know that this course is simultaneously offered in five different places. It's offered at the University of Yash, where there are students that care a lot about the international development. It's offered in Suchava. It's offered in Chernivtsi. And it's offered also in Zitomir, National Agroecological University. So I'm sure people from Zitomir will care a lot about today's topic in particular that will deal, among other policies, with the common agricultural policy. Because if it's the most important policy in terms of spending, yes, then in the headings you can put three other policies together to be greater than agriculture, yes. But in fact, agriculture represents 41%. Yes? And the others that represent 46%, it's the addition of regional policy, social policy, and industrial policy. <coughs> Good. On the spending side of the EU budget, the spending is much more progressive. So it means that the European Union spends much more on poorer uh, regions than, um, than it does on richer regions, yes? So that's why I mentioned that there are countries such as Romania or Greece or Hungary or Poland that uh, receive a large fraction of their income from the European Union budget. Yes, maybe up to 5%, uh, which is much compared to other countries that receive less. We saw that the case of the UK, they complained that they received too little and they wanted their money back. Yes, and Margaret Thatcher got this UK rebate. She got 66% of the money back. Yes. But now other countries also want their money back. But this is because um, when, when it comes to spending, the EU helps the, the countries that are lagging behind more than the other countries. Yes. And, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, what, what happens is that the system of um, allocating spending uh, expenditure has to be approved by by the member states of the European Union politically. And the, the, how is the budget made? The budget is made, firstly, every seven years, there's what is called the multi-annual financial framework is approved, which is like a framework that serves for, um, programming purposes and also for budgetary discipline for the next five years and that establishes uh, some uh, caps of on, on, on spending, spending caps. Uh, and uh, this is what determines, for instance, that the EU budget cannot exceed, cannot represent more than 1.20 percent of the European Union's gross national income. This is a multi-annual financial framework. We, when we discussed about correction mechanisms, we mentioned the period 2014-2020 because it's a seven-year period. It is the current financial framework covers from 2014 to 2020. This uh, <clears throat> financial frameworks, they need to be uh, approved by member state governments in the council by unanimity every seven years. They need to be approved by unanimity. And they also need the consent of the European Parliament, but approving it for unanimity is already 
more difficult than, than the to get the approval of the European Parliament. Yes. So the com the Commission prepares a multi-annual framework that needs to be approved by unanimity by all the member states. And this means that sometimes spending by the EU on the budget in general, we saw the correction mechanisms and we see even about spending, you know, spending is money spent on some some strange things like such as the fund for ad adjustment for uh, globalization and for instance that gives money to uh, the netherlands because there was a general motors factory in antwerp and there are many people who uh, lose their jobs because the factory moved elsewhere because of globalization and the 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 eu budget gives money to those people too it is not because they care more about uh, a worker in in the netherlands that earns two thousand euros per month than a romanian person that earns 200 euros per month it's not that it's something more simple than that it is that the budget of the european union needs to be approved by the member state governments and when the member state governments they discuss about the budget sometimes or often what they care most about is to mm, get the best possible deal for their own country because they want to be re-elected in their own country yes if if you are a romanian minister and you go to brussels to discuss the budget you want to bring the best possible deal for romania for Romanian voters that will determine that you will continue in power or not. And the result of this is that sometimes the budget is a little bit strange. I remember, I, will, I sometimes I tell you stories, I tell you anecdotes. Yes, they are just stories, they are anecdotes for you for it to be easier for you to but of course you need to read and you need to learn from books and you need to learn from data not just for from anecdotes yes but anyway they they are illustrative anecdotes in the year i think it was 1999 probably yes I was a Robert Schumann scholar in the European Parliament. And as part of, of this uh, period that I spent there in the European Parliament, they sent us to, to try to know the other institutions. And they paid us, uh, I was based in Luxembourg, and they paid us trips, for instance, to Brussels and trips to Strasbourg where the other um, headquarters of the European Parliament were. You know, the European Parliament, it, it is based in Brussels, in Strasbourg, and in Luxembourg. Yes, I was in, they sent me to Brussels once, and they invite me to attend a lecture at the European Commission uh, offices there that was about the financial framework and about the negotiations. We we are now in the period uh, that is 2014-2020, but at that time it was the period 2000-2013, and it was being negotiated then. And the Commission officials made a presentation and they said how the negotiations would be. And they, 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 they were about reforming European Union's regional policy. They thought that the EU's regional policy could work better 
if the money was concentrated on fewer objectives. If the money was concentrated, it, there were five objectives at the moment, they wanted to reduce that to only three objectives because regional policy has money for regions that are lagging behind in development that have low, low um, GDP per capita, but also for regions uh, of other kinds, for instance, that have undergone like uh, <coughs> industrial um, reconversion or, or something, or, or regions that are uh, slowly, how do you say, that, that are very, um, peripheral regions or that have a low population density or whatever. There were many kinds of objectives. There were five objectives at the moment. They wanted to reduce that to three. And they, 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 they told us how the negotiations were with the member states. And they said that they prepared Excel, uh, Excel uh, tables for the governments, yes, to show how the results of the uh, new system would be. And in these Excel tables, it shows how much money each country would receive with the new system, how much they receive with the old system, how much they would receive with the new system. So when the national governments want, went there to negotiate the regional development policy of the European Union, what they cared about was how much money they would receive themselves for their own country. Yes? And, and the, the, what was the result? The result was that, yes, the number of objectives was reduced formally. Yes, from five to three. But in practice, it was not reduced because then in the negotiations with member state governments, they have to create sub uh, objectives. For instance, to say, yes, we re reduce to three, but we create three A, three B, three C. And, and to justify spending that would benefit their countries. And this is what explains why you see that in the European Union, there are some countries that are completely lagging behind in terms of development, and they are much richer countries. But you still see that rich countries also receive part of the European Union spending. Yes? The European Union's Regional Development Fund was created in 1975. That is only two years after the UK joined the European Union in 1973. Until then, most of the money was spent on agriculture. And the French benefited a lot from agricultural spending, but the British they imported many agricultural goods, they didn't benefit so much. And they also wanted some money for them. So they created the Regional Development Fund. Because at that moment, in 1973, when they joined, the UK was not among the richest countries in the European community then. You know? So they asked for a fund from which they could benefit. And the European Regional Development Fund was created. <clears throat> so sometimes I have another seminar question. I have had it in the past. Why does the EU regional policy have so many objectives? Yes? <clears throat> And you know, sometimes the people who are experts on development, people who uh, are academics in this field, people who are 
uh, who work in this field, for instance, in the European Commission, they are not happy with the system. They complain that it doesn't work very much. Those who really believe in regional development, they are not very happy about it. But it's because we have these constraints, and the main constraint is that the EU budget needs to be approved by the member state governments yes so this is about regional regional policy social social policy also has on the european social fund that gives money for 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 people who are in disadvantage the uh, social groups how it is sold how it's marketed by the EU is that they support um, investment in human capital of people so that they can access better, better jobs in the future. So for them, it's not like a system or giving away money. It's an investment that they spend money on training people so that they become more productive in the future and get have better jobs. The, this is the European Social Fund. We sometimes have also a seminar question. What is the real purpose of the European Social Fund? Is it what the European Union website claims to invest in human capital and create jobs? <coughs> Or is it something else? And common agricultural policy. If you look at the website, it's about supplies, food supplies. But what is it in general? So here the argument is the official view and the critical view is that this money is just side payments. It's just giving away money. to buy support for the European Union. So, Valentina's group. <coughs> Valentina, please remove your mute. <coughs> we have discussed the main uh, expenditure policies such as regional policy, social policy, and the common agricultural policy. How, how do you see this? What, what do you think about these uh, spending policies? Do, do you see them as an opportunity, for instance, for Ukraine in the future? Or do you see them maybe as a waste of money? You see them as inefficient or you see them as necessary policies? Okay, uh, so as for me, uh, the current Spanish of European Union is, uh, is quite relevant according to the society's needs. So for Ukraine, of course, there are a lot of opportunities and possibilities, especially in terms of uh, common agriculture uh, policy and so on and so forth. Uh, just like the one point that maybe in future it would be better to, to improve that uh, European Union spends a lot of money on uh, the existence of the institution of EU. I mean the staff, and uh, so on and so far. So I read some uh, information that maybe it can be a little bit uh, balanced and uh, it, it's just sometimes it's too much on this point. But in general, I do consider the relevant expenditures uh, pretty normal for the EU. Good. Well, well, would you like to see that the European Union budget would be larger? would represent more than 1%? Or do you think it's already at a good level now? 
It, it depends on the future plans of the European Union as an institution. If the European Union wants to remain their stat, uh, like status and their role in the geopolitical arena, I think it's okay. But if the European Union wants to uh, upgrade uh, the European Union as an institution, and according to some theories, maybe to uh, change their role, so maybe the income should, should, should be increased. And now I have another question for this group. Who of you learned Spanish? <laughs> you learned Spanish? That's why you took yeah. this course? In this course you learn Spanish also. Because if I speak with Spanish accent, uh, you learn. You know, sometimes I, I, I learn uh, Romanian when my wife speaks Spanish because all the mistakes, all the mistakes he makes in, in Spanish I say ah it's maybe in Romania it's said like this eh? better to speak Romanian <laughs> ah you are Romanian too there yeah Doi studenti care știm limba română. Să știți că la Universitatea Ștefan cel Mare din Suceava este la școala de vară. Da, dar este acolo și un program de masterat care este predat în limba engleză și noi avem acum, nu știu, în jur de 20 de studenți care provin din acest masterat. Ei au și burse pentru români din diaspora, așa se numește acolo, adică pentru e, români din Ucraina și au burse pentru master acolo. Dar, e, din păcate, aceste burse nu sunt bune pentru masteratul predat în limba engleză, doar pentru masterate predate în limba română, care nu sunt așa de atragătoare și așa de bune. Ok, thank you. We put you in mute. Ok, so, Georgiana, I want your opinion. Please remove your mute. What do you think about the EU budget? Is it fair or not? Because you study literature, you study letters, yeah. and you know about issues such as solidarity. Yes? Yeah. You, you know about feelings, about uh, you study also at the Faculty of Philosophy. Now, yes, and these faculties, sometimes I, I fight with my colleagues there because I say, but what you teach is not about reality. It's not about how things work in the real world. What you teach is about how you would like yeah. things to be, yes? Yeah. And I fight with them. But now, after we have seen some descriptive information, some analysis about the, the EU budget, yes, it's time to discuss. What do you think about it? It's fair, this system, this EU budget, as it is now. Do you like it? Um, I think the EU budget could be more concerned with the poor countries and the poor regions in that, those countries. And... Um, but do you think that would be easy? Because you know, you know what happened, for instance, in the UK. Yes, yeah. in, in the last year, 70, the, the population of Romanian and Bulgarian people in the UK increased in one year only by 74,000 people. 
in one year in the only in the last year there are 74,000 more Romanians and Bulgarians living there uh, and uh, this created problems you know uh, and even the government sometimes they, they wanted to remain in the EU but the majority of people voted for Brexit yeah they 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 some sometimes the, the governments they depend on the support of their own people yeah. and their own people they do not like it so much that their money goes to Romanian people do, do, do you think this would be possible this would be acceptable well I think that it's normal that the British people to be upset that the uh, money to go to the Romanian people uh, but how about the German people? What do you think about the Germans that say all the countries in Europe, they pay 0.3% of their VAT base to the EU budget. We want to pay only 0.15%. Well, I think that, that they should think that not all the countries have the same budget and uh, there are poor and richer countries, so uh, every country should pay um, a num um, should pay <coughs> um, or what do you think about the money from the EU budget being spent on 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 Dutch workers? instead of Romanian workers? Well... Or do you think that maybe it should be spread? Like every country receives a, a little and, and so that Romania does not receive so much? Or what do you think? It should be concentrated on those who need it most? Or it should be a little bit for everyone? Well, it should be a little bit for everyone, but they should be aware that there are countries which need more, which need more, and um, with their help, maybe those countries may uh, may have a progress and uh, may help the, the budget of the European Union after the help that resides. Resides. So, I think they. Let's see, because now you can have the help from your colleague, Paula. Let's see what she says now. Okay, Paula, I don't know it. Paula you, yes. are, you are also uh, Just was... in letters, and you are now also a philosopher. Yes, I'm specialized in letters, but I was uh, I was living in UK for a certain time of period and worked there. And I can say that people and foreigners and everyone pay lots of taxes to the uh, to the government. You know, um, I don't know, but um, a perspective my, in my perspective would be that this uh, this budget is inefficient for the moment. Uh, because I would, uh, I don't know, I would uh, invest more in the, and donate more in the poorest uh, countries for the moment, which really needs uh, help. Mm -hmm. Good. How about uh, the people in Irina's group? Irina Kachuk's group. Is there anyone who wants to intervene? Natalia Bach. I see you. You think I do not know you or what? I know all of you, but uh, it takes time for me to to remember all those names. There are more than 90 people only in this course. <clears throat> Good, so they are shy. It, it doesn't matter. As a summary, the budget of the EU is small but controversial. It represents only 1% of the European Union's uh, gross national income, but uh, 
in some countries it has it, it can have a major influence or in some social groups or in some individuals it can mean a lot the 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 eu budget has two sides as any other budget it has an in, in income which was called the own resources and it has a, an expenditure side the own resources are mostly proportional with some a, a few regressive uh, corrections and the expenditure side is much more progressive spending much more on regions and groups that are less rich than average there's controversy about the budget if there's controversy about the size of the budget if it's too small if it should be bigger there's controversy about how the money is spent also there's controversy about if too much is spent on agriculture and too little is spent on, on other most important headings there's controversy also about how how much the countries contribute and how much they receive if they contribute more than they receive there's controversy about what we have discussed now about there should be solidarity or not but i think that with today's lecture you have now a clearer idea about the eu budget and the underlying debates it's important for us always in all our courses to achieve three main objectives in learning first is the descriptive empirical objective today i gave you a little bit of empirical information about the size of the budget about the periods of the multi-annual frameworks about the countries that have some correction mechanisms in the own resources system about the headings of uh, expenditure and so this is descriptive we also saw some analytical information about the how we can explain why is this happening like that how we can explain it from a positive point of view this means positive models and theories try to explain why why are there so many objectives for regional policy why is it that richer regions or richer groups they receive money when they're poor regions that would need that money most we have discussed the uh, also about why is it that the own resources system has these correction mechanisms that they may look weird they may look regressive as compared to the own resources system for national governments and uh, this is about what the european union is how we can explain that so this is the analytical theoretical objective but theoretical from a positive point of view what the eu is but then we also discussed about if we feel that it is right if it is fair if it should be reformed if it uh, is sufficient or not uh, how it should be reformed and this is a third objective this is a um, normative critical objective of the course so we will always see all those three objectives the first one empirical descriptive the second one analytical theoretical but positive theories and the third one which will be something like much more normative critical objective and we try to cover all those in our in our lectures and you should try to cover them also in the answers that you give 
to the seminar questions. The seminar questions that you have online are a good opportunity for you to show how much you have learned from an empirical descriptive point of view, from an analytical uh, theoretical point of view, and also finally from a normative critical point of view. But we cannot be just critical, just uh, <coughs> normative to say what the EU should do, what the, we like about the EU, what we do not like, what we would like to see change, if we do not first show that we know the empirics, we know how it really works, and that we can explain how it really works, then the third objective is how we would like it to work, how we should change it. But this is the third, only after the first and second objectives. Yes? Next week, we will see uh, another very important topic, which is about also about EU policies, about um, home and foreign policies of the European Union. So very interesting, very current topics such as immigration, such as uh, the refugee crisis, but also uh, sanctions to Russia, the situation in, as a consequence of this situation in Ukraine, but we will see also the commercial policy of the EU, the trade policy with countries such as um, China, India, Brazil, the comprehensive uh, uh, agreement signed with uh, Canada that has been also very controversial controversial recently. So we will see all those kinds of home and foreign policies of the EU that are also increasingly uh, important. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have liked this video, please uh, give it a like. Also, if you have watched this video on YouTube, please write your name on the comments. Thank you very much and see you next week.